Virus infections in hosts fall into one of two general patterns. They can be acute or they can be persistent. And in the next two lectures, I want to go over what that means and give you some examples of both. Today, we're going to start with acute infections. And here are the general patterns of infection. The acute infection is shown on the top. This graph shows you time on the x-axis versus uh, virus production in the blue line and disease is shown by the red bar. So in an acute infection, which is at the top here, uh, you have relatively rapid development of viral titers and disease, and then it goes away. Your immune system engages. For the most part, you clear the infection. So the time can vary a bit, but it's a finite infection. It comes and it goes. That's why we call it acute. And we're going to talk about examples of this today. Now next week, next Monday, we'll talk about persistent infections. And these are basically infections that stay with you for your life. Uh, that's my definition. An infection that stays with you for the life. Yes? Sorry, what's the blue line? The blue line is virus production. So you get a defined PKU. period of what? And PKU. PFU. PFU. Sorry. Well. <laughs> PKU. PK. That means, some, that means something else, right? <laughs> It's okay, BFU. It's not a problem. Uh, virus. So the persistent infections stay with you for life. So all of you are persistently infected with a couple of herpes viruses. And we'll talk about how that works uh, on Monday. And these are some of these persistent patterns down here. You can see the virus is produced for a long time, sometimes in bursts. You don't always have disease and so forth. We'll go into that. Uh, more next time. Today I want to focus on acute infections. Here's a typical acute infection. Again, we're looking at virus growth on the y-axis in PFU, okay, not PKU. I don't mean to single you out. I think it's funny. It's okay. And um, duration of infection, the time. So the virus comes in here, gets into the host. Uh, the virus starts to grow. That's the red line. You have innate defenses, intrinsic and innate defenses are engaged. And as the virus titer rises, you engage the adaptive response. Uh, and then finally, as the adaptive response kicks in, the virus is cleared, disease is resolved, and eventually there's no more virus. And you have memory. So this is a key point. There's no more virus after the infection's over. There's no more virus and no more virus genomes. That's what an acute infection is. It's, a, it's an infection that comes and goes and is resolved. And what I'd like to do today is give you some examples of these using well-known virus infections, which will help illustrate what an acute infection is. Now, all infections are characterized by an incubation period. And this is the time before symptoms of a disease are obvious. You can't tell that you're infected. However, viruses are in you. The genomes are replicating. You're making an immune response, and eventually, um, you get these global symptoms of infection caused by interferons and cytokines, fever, malaise, et cetera. That's the incubation period before the typical signs of the disease arise. So for influenza, coughing, runny nose, uh, sneezing, et cetera, those would be the typical signs. But before that, as the virus comes in, first you don't know it's there, and then you have these global signs of infection. Uh, that are shown at the bottom there. So that's the incubation period followed by the overt disease. And this goes for both acute and persistent infections as well. Persistent infections often begin with an acute infection that stays uh, for a long time. So here are some incubation periods just to give you a sense of the range that an incubation period can be. It can go from a day or two for some of the respiratory viruses that you see there, uh, getting longer, uh, for herpes, for example, five to eight days, polio, <coughs> six to 12, measles a bit longer, and it gets longer and longer and longer for some of these viruses. Rabies, 30 to 100 days. And, and the one at the bottom here, this is from the textbook. This is AIDS or HIV-1 infection, a one to 10 year incubation period. I actually don't agree that this is correct. It's, the incubation period is at the beginning of the infection. This happens to be a very long persistent infection, and we'll talk about this separately. Nevertheless, you can see that incubation periods can vary, and many of these are acute virus infections. So rabies is an acute virus infection. 
it comes and goes. Unfortunately, most of the time you're dead when it goes, but it's, it's over. Uh, it doesn't stay with you. Some of these other viruses tend to be persistent. So this is a mix of acute and persistent <coughs> infections. In, t in general, the viruses with a short uh, incubation period, that usually means that the disease is caused pretty much near where the virus enters. So a respiratory virus causing respiratory disease doesn't have to go very far. That's why the incubation period is short. And as the incubation times get longer in general, the virus, that means the viruses have to move away from the primary site. So some, for example, measles comes in through the respiratory mucosa, has to get into the blood and spread through lymphoid organs before it causes the typical rash. So that takes a while. Yes? The reason AIDS is long is because you considered the pro-viral stage incubation, or what is incubation then? All right, so for AIDS, and we will have a, a lecture on this, but the virus comes in, there's an acute infection, which resolves. The virus is still there, though, and then the virus stays with you for many, many years, slowly destroying your immune system. So some people consider that one to 10 year period an incubation period, but I don't, because you've already had that at the beginning of the infection. So we have to, I have to convince my co-authors to change this in the next textbook. Now remember, a long time ago, we talked about inapparent infections. Viruses where, vir uh, infections where the virus is in you and replicating, but you can't tell. And this, is, this happens for both acute and persistent infections. Again, there's successful infections where there are no symptoms. Virus is replicating, and we know this because we take serum from people in a population, and we see antibodies to a virus, and they have not had the disease. And as I told you, many uh, infections with poliovirus are asymptomatic, many others. This is characteristic of what I call well-adapted pathogens. They come in you, they don't cause disease, they replicate and move on to another host. After all, that is really what the virus uh, evolves to do, to move on to a new host. And, uh, and disease is often uh, accidental. So um, in apparent acute infections are quite frequent. Not every virus does it, but uh, it's quite, quite frequent. And this is a problem, an inapparent infection is one of the reasons why acute infections are big, big problems. Influenza and measles and a number of other respiratory viral infections are problems for epidemiologists, for physicians, for scientists, because they spread very quickly, because you have this large population of individuals who are infected, they're spreading virus, and no one knows it, essentially. And so uh, these, are, these are, by the time you feel ill, the infection is over. Or if it's an apparent infection, of course, you never feel ill and you're spreading the infection. So uh, many acute infections, when they do become symptomatic, it's usually a few days after virus shedding has already taken place. So you're spreading virus to others. And in closed situations, this leads to rapid virus spread. And that's why these viruses often cause uh, big epidemics every year. So a combination of inapparent infections and the incubation period during which you're shedding virus leads to this issue. It is which of the following do acute infections and incubation periods have in common? The answer is number three, but there's a lot of number two, so let's talk about that. Okay, acute infections and incubation periods, what do they have in common? The virus is not replicating. That's clearly not true, and you got that right. No symptoms are visible. Well, of course, um, in an incubation period, no symptoms uh, are visible. That's one of the definitions. But certainly in an acute infection, there are symptoms. We, and the question doesn't specify uh, any particular part of the acute infection, so that wouldn't be right for both. And this is the correct one, a rise in antibodies. So of course, in, in an incubation period, you're starting to make an immune response to the virus and an acute infection you do as well. The immune system does not respond is not correct. And uh, it's not all of the above. It's a little tricky question, I know. But the point is there that uh, we are making antibodies. Yes? But in the case of an acute infection, doesn't symptoms don't show up until after the infection is over, right? No, no. In, in, the question is, in an acute infection, isn't it the case that symptoms don't show up until the infection is over? No, they, they actually show up during the infection. If you look at that very first slide, the, bar, the red bar is symptoms. 
All right, so as virus is peaking, symptoms are peaking. So you said that by the time you feel ill, the infection may be over. And that's yeah, so typically the virus titer is beginning to decline uh, as, as you're just feeling ill. So you can't, um, it's, it's hard to treat these infections as a consequence because by the time you feel ill, the virus titer is declining and there's no point in, in treating it. Okay, now I want to talk about one, two, three, four, five, six different acute infections, uh, each of them rather briefly with a few exceptions. Just to give you an idea of how this works, we're going to talk about influenza virus, poliovirus, uh, measles here, the envelope virus, rotavirus, norovirus, and West Nile. And these I picked to illustrate different ways the virus gets in and spreads. So we have a couple of respiratory entry, influenza, and measles. Influenza remains localized in the respiratory tract, whereas measles spreads. We have a couple of viruses acquired by the oral route, by fecal oral contamination, polio, rota, and noro. And West Nile is, is spread by a mosquito vector. So influenza uh, is an envelope virus with a segmented genome in eight pieces. It comes in three types. They're called A, the B, and C, and A and B we worry about the most. Our vaccine has A and B components in them. They cause a similar disease. Uh, C-type viruses don't really account for much respiratory disease, and so there's no uh, vaccine against type C. And only the A-types cause pandemics, and a pandemic is a global epidemic. Everybody in the world, not everyone, all parts of the world are involved in the outbreak of infection. And a, and a hallmark of this virus is antigenic variation. A couple of lectures ago, we talked about how viruses can evade adaptive responses, how they can evade antibodies, and flu is a master at this because the virus can spawn so many mutants, it can readily escape antibodies. And when we talk about vaccines, we'll discuss how this impacts vaccine uh, formulation. Now, the virus enters your respiratory tract uh, through, the, through the nose, typically, or sometimes the mouth. Uh, it goes down into the upper tract and replicates in the mucosal epithelium. Uh, and uh, of course, it stimulates an innate and eventually an adaptive response by the mechanisms that we've talked about. Infection largely stays limited to these epithelial cells. With very few exceptions, the virus doesn't traverse the basement membrane. It does not get into the circulation. There are some exceptions with uh, avian influenza that we'll talk about later. Influenza can be a mild upper tract infection. You can see here it's one of the viruses that can be localized to the upper tract and cause rhinitis, pharyngitis, or laryngitis. But more typically, the influenza that we all know, the virus moves down into the trachea uh, and causes the, the chest pain and the burning sensation that we often associate with influenza, but not with the common cold. And sometimes the virus can get down into the alveoli and cause pneumonia, a very serious uh, infection. It does so by moving along the epithelial <coughs> layer. The virus is transmitted by respiratory droplets. If you remember the sneezing movie, when you sneeze or talk, you, you expel many droplets. If you have a virus infection, these contain virus particles, and this can transmit infection. We can also transmit by contact. If someone is touching their nose and they're infected, they're going to have virus on their fingers. If they shake your hand, they could transmit virus to you if you put then the hand in your nose or your eye. And we all tend to do that quite a bit, and probably also to a certain extent uh, contact with contaminated surfaces. A study was done uh, uh, not too many years ago uh, showing that the virus can survive on banknotes for a couple of weeks. They, actually, they did this experiment in Switzerland with Swiss banknotes. I think that was, that was an appropriate study. They took banknotes in the lab and they pipetted virus on. And if you mix it with mucus, it can stay infectious on the banknote for two weeks. So the sooner we get away from currency, the better. Although I guess Bitcoin is not the answer, right? <laughs> All right, so that's how it's transmitted. Uh, uncomplicated influenza, which is what most of us get, it, there's a short incubation period. So again, acute infection associated with an incubation period. Um, and then all of a sudden you feel it. You can pinpoint the day you get flu, usually in retrospect. You get a headache, you feel chilly, you get this dry cough, uh, and then you get a, a fever with muscle aches, and uh, you don't feel very energetic, you don't feel like eating, 
the fever peaks very quickly and then it declines and is gone, but as you'll see, it's re replaced by respiratory symptoms. And in very young and very old people, this typical influenza can be very different. It can be much more severe. Uh, as the fever goes away, you get a cough. You get a very productive cough. It's very unusual. You initially get this really high fever, no, not much respiratory activity, and then all of a sudden you get a, a cough, and then towards the end you're making a lot of mucus, and the, that, that is what a productive cough is. You're making a lot of mucus. And then even after the virus is gone, uh, the cough and, and feeling lousy can persist uh, for quite a long time. And this is in part because many cells in the respiratory tract are destroyed and they have to be repaired. And that's a combination of virus replication and cytotoxic T cells killing the infected cells. And as I said, the virus can replicate throughout the tract. We'll talk about the influence of sialic acids on the replication uh, because different influenza viruses have preferences and we have certain sialic acids in certain places and the relevance of that will become evident a bit later. Uh, to diagnose influenza, these are some of the criteria that are used. Uh, it's called influenza-like illness or ILI, fever at least 100 degrees, cough or sore throat, and no other known causes. So if you show up in the flu season at a physician's office with these symptoms, they will assume you have influenza and give you an antiviral. They do have rapid lab tests that they can do in the office. They can take a respiratory swab and do these dipstick type tests, but they're really poorly accurate and uh, are not really, most physicians will not end up using them. You can do PCR or culture or serology, of course, but that takes a lot longer. And by the time you did all of that, your infection would be waning. So. The diagnosis is pretty much by these very simple symptoms in the right time of year. If it's the summertime, they're not going to think influenza, of course. There are a couple of interesting studies just giving you an idea of the pattern of virus shedding. So on the top, this is actually an experiment done in volunteers. So you can infect people with mild strains of influenza virus. You can see these individuals, you, you pipette the virus in the nose, and that's day zero. Then we'll look at virus titers here on the y-axis in uh, nasal secretions and uh, symptoms, so the people report how they feel. If they, f they have a score sheet to fill out, depending on what kind of symptoms they have, you know, they go from zero to one. And so the virus shedding is in the black here. So you can see on day one, you're shedding a good amount of virus. The symptoms aren't so severe, so you might not know you have influenza. You start to shed virus and you can infect other people. So this is the incubation period where so you're shedding and you don't have many symptoms. And eventually the symptoms increase and you see when they peak, the virus titer is already declining. So that's, that's what I meant. If you wait till the peak of flu symptoms, when you feel really lousy and you go f to a physician, they're not gonna give you Tamiflu because it's too late to have any impact. You have to go uh, earlier on in the first 24 hours, ideally, or at least the first 48 hours. This is another similar study where uh, volunteers were also infected and we're looking at days after virus administration and we're looking at both virus titer, that's this straight line here. Uh, you can see it peaks very rapidly. And here's the febrile illness right here, and it goes away. And then it declines quickly. And then we're looking at interferon here, which peaks early on. And then finally, antibodies come up much later, as you see. These are antibody levels way after the virus has declined. So the antibodies don't have any role really in clearing. This is all cellular mediated clearing. But of course, the antibodies eventually result in memory and that's important for your next uh, infection. So again, uh, a very rapidly replicating virus, but then you have respiratory symptoms for quite a time uh, after this. This is a seasonal infection, as we've talked about before. And these are um, isolations of influenza virus from uh, the US from 2004 through 2008. And there is a global network of laboratories that collects specimens from people suspected to have influenza. And they are analyzed for specific influenza viruses. And that's what all these colors are, three different A viruses and a B virus. And you can see there's a peak of influenza every winter in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, very regularly. And off season, the spring and the summer and the fall, there's not a lot of flu, but there is some. And it's thought that that's one of the ways the virus is maintained uh, until the next season by these little uh, infections that go on in the, summertime, in the summertime. This is this year's influenza activity. 
uh, the season. So these are, this is 2013. It started about week 40-ish towards the end of the year. So typically the flu season starts in roughly October and goes through uh, April or May. And you can see there was a peak uh, at the turn of the year. And these are virus isolation. So percent positive samples are shown here. Of all the samples submitted, these are virus positive. And then uh, these are the particular viruses that were identified in the colored bars. And you can see it's been declining rather uh, rapidly. Uh, week 12, uh, the uh, third month, March, which is what we're in now, is not much activity at all, although there is still some uh, influenza and it will continue on for another uh, month or so. So this is a very typical per pattern for uh, a climate such as ours where we have spring and, and winter. Now flu influenza can um, cause very severe disease. It can kill people. And so we have a reporting system in place. And you, you typically uh, do not, sign. if someone dies of influenza, it's typically the death certificate doesn't have influenza on it. It has pneumonia or some other complication. It's very rare that influenza is put on the death certificate. So to estimate the amount of death, we look at the uh, excess uh, pneumonia mortality over what we consider the epidemic threshold. So again, every year there's a, an oscillating uh, pattern of pneumonia, much caused by influenza. And the two black lines show you the typical rate of a pneumonia. And then uh, in some seasons, there's an excess in mortality, like this peak 2012-2013 uh, se uh, season. A lot of that caused by influenza, but you can't prove it because you don't typically have virus isolation. And again, as I said, the death certificate does not have um, influenza on it. And here, the 2013-14 season, uh, we did have excess influenza mortality, uh, but less than the previous year. And you see some years the mortality is quite low. It really depends on the, on the virus that's circulating. And of course, the immunity in the population, I think, also makes a big difference. Now, this is a, a graph of laboratory-confirmed hospitalizations. So people get sick enough to have to go to hospital. And there, you can diagnose the infection quite readily. And this... Um, is this past flu season, and this is the week, this is week 52 of 2012. So not a lot of hospitalizations yet. This is the rate per 100,000 population. But then you see at the beginning of the year, it starts to go up very high. And these higher peaks are the very old and the very young. So here is 65 plus years of age. This is 50 to 64 years of age. And this is zero to four years of age. So very old and very young tend to go hospital a lot for influenza. And then here are the uh, younger people, um, your age. I can't say that I'm in this group any longer, I'm sorry. So, uh, but I've never been hospitalized for influenza. Uh, typically in the US, there's about 35 to 50 million cases a year of influenza. It's a lot, it's a lot of infections. And these are estimates, of course, from serological and virus isolation studies with anywhere from 3,000 to 49,000 deaths. Now this is a range based on the past 31 year experience. And that doesn't mean that every year 49,000 people die, but it depends on the particular year, the virus, the level of the immunity and so forth. Uh, but often in the press we'll say flu kills 40,000 people each year. Well, that's not true, it doesn't. It, it kills a range of people, but that's still a lot of people. And you don't wanna be one of them, of course, and you don't want anyone that you know or like to be one of them or anyone to die of influenza. It's a preventable disease. And that's why we have a vaccine uh, against the disease. You can have serious complications, which are shown here. You can have pneumonia. The virus goes into your alveoli, replicates, causes problems. In many cases, especially in the old, you have secondary bacterial pneumonia for reasons we still don't know, understand. Uh, virus infection predisposes to strep pneumonia and other bacteria coming in and causing pneumonia. Generalized muscle pain, sometimes cardiac involvement, often because of, of belabored breathing in many cases, and a paralytic syndrome that's transient called uh, RISE syndrome. And we don't really understand how many of these arise, but it's probably safe to say that they may be, some of them may be related to a cytokine production. What do you do when you have influenza? Well, if you get to the uh, physician within 24 to 48 hours, they will prescribe 
uh, antiviral drugs, and we have a couple of them as shown here. We'll talk about how they work in the antiviral lecture. But if it's past 48 hours, it's not worth taking because they will not do anything. You can go over the counter, of course, and take things that you think might make you feel better. Uh, and then, of course, there's a vaccine which you would take ahead of time, which would prevent you from getting ill uh, in the first place. And uh, we don't, most, only 40 or 50 percent of the U.S. takes the vaccine at any given time. And we'll talk more about that um, in the vaccine lecture. Next question, which of the following is characteristic of uncomplicated influenza? Has anyone had flu this year? No one? Do you all, did you all get vaccinated? Amazing. I'm impressed. Good. Very good. All of the above, of course. Those are all symptoms uh, of influenza, as I just told you. All right, the next virus is polio. Polio virus, which we've talked a bit about already because we work on this. Uh, this is an icosahedral virus, very different from uh, influenza. No envelope, uh, about 30 nanometers in diameter with a plus stranded RNA genome. This virus is, enters us when we ingest it. We ingest fecally contaminated material. Feces contains the virus. Uh, we swallow it, it passes through our stomach, small intestine, and replicates in the intestinal mucosa. So it's very resistant to low and high pH and digestive enzymes and bile salts and so forth. Gets into the intestinal mucosa, replicates in the cells, causes inflammation, spreads beyond the basement membrane, and gets into the blood. It, it establishes a viremia. And then in 99% of infections, that's all we see. Uh, the virus is produced in the intestinal epithelium. It's shed into the lumen, and we shed virus in, in large quantity in the feces. And there's no GI symptoms associated with this replication. So most of the time, the virus is simply replicating and moving on. But in 1% of infections, the virus makes its way to the spinal cord. We think that from the blood, the virus gets into the muscle. It enters the neuromuscular junction, the nerve ending, and it's taken by retrograde axonal transport to the motor neuron in the spinal cord. And there, the virus replicates, destroys the motor neuron. And if it destroys enough neurons in the cord, you get the paralysis that's associated with 1% of infections. Uh, this is a section of a spinal cord from a transgenic poliovirus receptor expressing mouse that we talked about last time. So this mouse had been injected with poliovirus. It was paralyzed, and a section of the spinal cord was taken. And this section is hybridized with viral RNA. So we're looking for viral RNA replication. All these green dots are where the virus is replicating. And these are neurons. You can tell by their size and shape. No other, no other cell in the spinal cord is infected because they don't have receptors for the virus. And here, these darkly staining cells are some kind of immune cell. Uh, we didn't identify them that, that are coming into the cord to try and clear uh, the infection. So this is a time course of poliovirus infection. This is actually taken from a 1950s textbook of medicine. So at one point, there was a chapter on polio <coughs> in medical textbooks. You're not, in the US, you're not going to find that anymore because we don't have any more polio. But this is one of these old-fashioned hand-drawn uh, images, which is compiled from lots and lots of human polio cases. It's really, really informative. And what we're looking at is time after infection. So the exposure would be here to the virus. We're looking at time after infection. Every panel has a different parameter. Uh, so for example, the top is the temperature. So you can see there's an incubation period of about seven days, and you have a spike in temperature here. You may have a headache, sore throat, nausea, you know, these nonspecific virus symptoms. Uh, and then most people clear the infection and they get better, and that's the end of the infection. At the same time, you have virus in the feces, which persists for a long time. So look at this is over 30 days, and so you get better from this seemingly nonspecific infection, you're still shedding virus. You can transmit it to a lot of people. That's why it spreads very effectively. Virus and throat secretions, e even virus can replicate there for a shorter amount of time. Uh, associated with that little spike in temperature, you have virus in the blood. So this is virus now in the blood here. It's transient. You can see it goes up and down. Uh, and then, as I said, in most infections at the end, but in 1% of the infections, you get a second episode after the fever goes down, suddenly you get a higher spike in temperature associated with headache, nausea, and paralysis. And that is when the virus gets into the CNS, 
So this bottom panel is virus in the CNS. You can see there's no virus initially associated with that nonspecific uh, episode, but then the virus gets in the CNS and replicates to high titers there, and that is associated with the paralysis about 12 to 15 days uh, after infection. Now, eventually, everyone clears the virus. You may not recover limb function if you were paralyzed, but otherwise the virus is gone. So this is an acute infection. There's no persistence. So we're the only known reservoir of this virus. As I said, it's passed from human to human by fecal oral contamination. We basically have really bad hand hygiene, especially kids, and they contaminate their hands with virus-laden feces, and then they will spread it to other kids. And you just have to watch people in the bathrooms to know that most people don't wash their hands, and if they had polio, they'd be spreading it all over the place. In temperate climates, it, it's more likely to occur during warm months. There is a long-term sequelae called post-polio syndrome. Many people who initially have paralytic polio 30 to 40 years later, uh, about 25 to 40 percent of them get this. That's a return of their paralysis. But it's not an infectious process. There's no virus present. It seems to be that aging, as we age, we normally lose neurons. But if, you have had, if you've lost many to polio infection already, then you can't compensate and you will get paralysis again. And we still have people with this complication in the U.S. because polio uh, was ongoing until the, the mid-50s. The vaccine has eliminated polio from the U.S. We will talk more about this in detail. We have two vaccines, uh, one an inactivated vaccine introduced in the 1950s and the infectious oral vaccine introduced in 1961. Uh, the last case of polio in 1979 in the U.S. and there's now no polio. But we will talk about this in much more detail later. The next virus is measles, which is an enveloped virus with a negative stranded uh, RNA genome, Par member of the paramyxoviridae family, one of the most contagious human viruses we know of. And this number, the R0 or the reproductive index, that's a measure of how many people an infected person will infect. So if you are infected with measles, you're likely to infect 15 other people, which is really high among viruses. Most viruses are down in the two or three range. You do need a big population to maintain the virus, three to 500,000, and so certain island populations that are isolated that have small populations don't get measles because it's not enough to sustain virus replication. There's one serotype of the virus. Now, in contrast, there were three of polio, and we need to immunize against all three of those. The one serotype of measles confers lifelong protection. This is transmitted by the respiratory route, and we'll talk about how that happens in a moment. And before you get the rash, so the typical symptom of measles is a rash on the skin. Before you get the rash, you're shedding virus and infecting other people. And so kids, back in the day before immunization, they used to get measles and uh, go to school, of course, and the virus is replicating in them, and they're shedding it and spreading it. So that's why you have uh, outbreaks during this incubation period. And uh, there's very little asymptomatic infection with measles, all right? So again, this is one of the viruses where almost every infection causes some kind of symptom, which is good. So, you know, a kid that has a rash clearly has measles and shouldn't be sent to school. Uh, but the problem is that a couple of days before the rash, you're shedding virus and you don't know it. Now, the pathogenesis of measles is very interesting. Again, the virus enters the respiratory tract, so it's spread by respiratory secretions, contaminated hands, and so forth. It goes into the respiratory tract, but the virus doesn't actually enter the respiratory epithelium. Unlike influenza virus, the virus instead is taken up by immune cells that are patrolling this area, uh, dendritic cells, macrophages, even lymphoid cells. They take up the virus uh, and bring it to the lymph node where it then infects T cells and spreads through the blood from there. So it doesn't infect the respiratory epithelium. It's just captured by immune cells. You get a primary viremia. That seeds the virus to other organs, including the spleen and secondary lymphoid organs where there are lots of lymphocytes. The virus likes to replicate uh, in lymphocytes. And then you get a secondary viremia. All right, so the primary is the result of the initial virus coming in, replicating, and then you have a secondary. And that secondary viremia brings the virus to the skin where you have an immune reaction 
that causes the rash. So it takes a little bit of time for the virus to get from the respiratory tract to the skin. Now, this virus is spread by respiratory secretions, but if it doesn't replicate in the mucosal epithelial cells, how is it spread? Well, this was a mystery up until a couple of years ago. And someone figured out that what happens is there is a receptor for the virus on the basolateral surface of the respiratory epithelium. All right, so that's the respiratory epithelium during entry. And now the viremia brings uh, virus there. There's a receptor called nectin-4 on the bottom. It's not present on the top. There's no nectin-4 receptor on the top of these cells. So that's why the virus doesn't infect them initially. But the virus can access these uh, cells, this receptor. The virus may be brought there by infected immune cells. And the virus replicates in the epithelium and then is shed in the lumen, and that's how you spread it to others. So it takes a couple of days for that shedding to begin, but it does begin before the rash initiates. So it's really unusual. The virus doesn't enter the epithelium. It passes through it in an immune cell and eventually does replicate later on as it enters the basal lateral domain of the epithelium. Now, in addition to the rash, there are some rare complications of measles. You can get encephalitis, a brain infection, which is problematic. And also a long-term chronic infection can result. So here is one uh, example of an acute virus infection that can lead to a persistent infection. This is a, um, a long-term event that happens 30 to 40 years after measles, and it involves chronic neurological degeneration. We don't understand what's going on. There's some evidence that bits of the viral genome are present in the brain of these individuals. It's rather rare, but always fatal. So that's an example of a virus with both acute and persistent uh, phases. So uncomplicated measles, high fever, respiratory systems, symptoms, cough, runny nose, uh, inflammation of the conjunctiva, and of course the rash uh, from the face to the extremities, very typical of measles. And um, also another feature is called coplic spots. Uh, these may be hard to see, but this is basically a rash on the inside of the mouth, which is basically virus infecting uh, the cells and causing syncytia formation, the fusion of cells to give you uh, multinucleate cells. So very early on in infection, you can actually get a presumptive diagnosis of measles by finding these spots in the mouth of the infected child. Uh, some complications, as I mentioned, encephalitis, one in a thousand infections. So that's pretty frequent. So you don't want to have measles because one in a thousand is quite a risk. Bronchitis, pneumonia, ear infections can result. Fatality, one to two in a thousand. That's a lot. And if you have poor nutrition, it goes even higher. It's SSPE, the long-term neurological sequelae. And of course, this virus causes immunosuppression. As we talked about last time, it replicates in immune cells. And that's the main cause of death uh, in third world children who get infected with other agents, other viruses, and other bacteria. Now, um, at one time in the U.S., these were the numbers for measles, three to four million infections a year, four to 500 deaths, 48,000 hospitalizations, and 1,000 kids every year chronically disabled from viral encephalitis. This is why we developed the measles vaccine. And by 2000, transmission was stopped. It's now given to kids as part of measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, it's three different viruses at once. Very sadly, in 1998, a British gastroenterologist Andrew Wakefield published a paper saying that this uh, immunization caused autism and this was a completely wrong publication which took years to be retracted but unfortunately has caused a lot of anti-MMR sentiment globally and in particularly in the UK and Ireland there have been big outbreaks of the disease in the U.S., we have now entered a situation where we have mostly gotten rid of measles, but there are outbreaks, especially from strains brought in uh, across the pond there. And there's an outbreak ongoing in New York City. There have been 20 cases of measles, all in kids whose parents decided that they wouldn't give them a vaccine because they thought it would cause autism. They don't trust the vaccine. Jenny McCarthy has a lot to do with this. She was a big opponent of MMR years ago. So this is an article in the Daily Beast, brought thanks anti-vaxxers, thanks to the loons who refuse to vaccinate their children. And then here is the, it's the link for that if you want to read the rest of it.
And here is an, um, a publication from the New York City Health Department. Here's the link for that if you want to check that out. So there have been 20 cases so far in, in Manhattan. So again, if you don't immunize, you will get measles and you'll have outbreaks. And these kids are at risk. They can get encephalitis and they can die. And there are no side effects of the measles vaccine whatsoever. It's been studied intently. I absolutely do not understand the failure to vaccinate against this disease. Uh, the, this is the way vac measles look like in the U.S. Lots of cases in the 50s and 60s. Vaccine licensed here in the 60s and pretty much gone except for these little outbreaks that we get. I mean, these are not huge outbreaks, right? But no kid should get measles or have complications from it. There's still a lot of measles globally because we can't get the vaccines to many countries. Uh, this is a colored map showing countries with no measles, and there are a few of them, you can see here, uh, with a few cases of measles and with 100 to 999. Unfortunately, we're in the 100 to 999 country, which is crazy. And then some countries have over 1,000 cases, and uh, that's because vaccine distribution isn't very well done. But if we could get the vaccine to everyone, we could get rid of this infection. This is a human-only infection, so it's eradicable. But the, the vaccine is injected, so you need trained healthcare personnel to administer the injection. It's not so easy to administer. And once polio is eradicated, the plan is then to eradicate measles. So again, this is a, a feasible goal, but uh, I, if people are not gonna take the vaccine, you can't, you can't eradicate it, obviously. We'll have more to say about that uh, in the vaccine lecture. All right, the next question is, which of the following is a good reason to get measles vaccine? I see I have an agenda here. I want you guys to <laughs> go on in your lives when you have kids to make sure you immunize them. All right, so there's no problem with any measles vaccine, right? Let's not get off the topic of this is measles. There is a problem with polio vaccine. And we will talk about that in the vaccine lecture. But Nigeria stopped immunizing, okay? They stopped cold turkey because they didn't trust the Western product. And that screwed everything up because now Nigeria still has polio, even though they resumed immunizing uh, afterwards. So th it's a very interesting story. We will talk about that in quite some detail. Now, the, one of the polio vaccines does have side effects. It causes polio. And we... <laughs> and, <laughs> That's a problem. I totally agree. I totally agree. But it's not measles vaccine. This is a different vaccine. This vaccine doesn't cause measles. We used that virus in the U.S. from 1960 to 2000. Every year, seven to eight cases of paralytic polio caused by the vaccine. And I don't know, you know why the U.S. public health decided that that was a good move. But absolutely, polio vaccine can cause polio. But that's the only one that causes the disease that it's designed to prevent. But you should not let that uh, influence giving measles vaccine because measles vaccine doesn't cause measles. It is an inactivated vaccine. It's formal and treated. It can't cause um, polio. Uh, okay, what do we got here? All of the above, right? Yeah. One person said there's a one to two. Yeah, that's true. There is a one to two in a thousand chance, but all these other things are true also. Let's talk about gastroenteritis. You guys had lunch, yeah, but a long time ago. This is a cool, this is a cool statistic. In any 24-hour period, about 200 million people have gastroenteritis, and the amount of water they pass is equal to what passes over Victoria Falls in one minute, which is just over 65 million liters. And I got this from a gastroenterologist who knows these things. So that's a lot of water. So I'm going to talk about two viruses that cause gastroenteritis. First one is rotavirus. Most common cause of childhood gastroenteritis. You have pretty much all had rotavirus infections, probably very young age and you don't remember it. Um, used to cause a lot of problems in the US. This is a yearly number now, 25 million uh, physician visits, 2 million hospitalizations, 800,000 deaths. And before the vaccine in the US, every, all children were infected by five years of age, and one in 72 were hospitalized. 
The problem is that when you get diarrhea, you can get dehydrated. If you're a very young baby, you can die without fluid replacement. And often you have to be taken to the emergency room given IV fluids because a young baby is not going to drink enough to replace the fluids that he or she is losing. And this causes high mortality in developing worlds because they don't have the facilities to rehydrate people. You can't just walk into an ER and get an IV. So there's 5% of all mortality in these developing countries less than five years of age. Here is the global distribution now at the, at the moment of deaths. Uh, we have used the vaccine in the US, which has pretty much eliminated rotavirus deaths, so we have less than 10 per 100,000, <coughs> excuse me. But you see a number of countries still have a huge burden of rotavirus lethality. And there, is, there are some vaccines, as you will see, and these are being used extensively. So in, in a number of years, these should uh, all go away. There's absolutely no reason for them any longer. The virus is a double-stranded RNA virus with a segmented genome, and it has two shells in the capsid. So this is a member of the real virus family, which we talked about earlier in this course. Uh, rotavirus was discovered in 1972 from people that had gastroenteritis and couldn't figure out what the cause was. And a virologist at the NIH, Albert Kapikian, was looking at stool with the electron microscope, and he saw these particles. And they looked like wheels, so he called them rotavirus, because rota is Latin for wheel. And uh, since then, we've learned that they cause a lot of infections. <clears throat> Transmitted by fecal oral contamination. Again, we don't have good hand hygiene. And look at all the particles that you make. 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 10th per mil of feces. Of course, there's, it's watery diarrhea at this point. A lot of virions. You only need between 10 and 100 to get infected. So you can see why it transmits so readily. As I said, uh, young children are at the risk of dehydration. So initially, when you're born and within your first years of life, you encounter rotavirus uh, in a variety of ways from other children, from your family. Older children and adults can get reinfected, so immunity doesn't last, but you get very mild symptoms. So I could be infected and not show any symptoms, and I could shed virus, and if I had bad hygiene, which I do not, <laughs> I, I could spread it to unsuspecting children, for example. <laughs> but I have no young children around anyway, so that wouldn't be a problem. But you can see that older people who get infected if you got infected, you could spread it to children as well. But for some reason, immunity isn't protective against infection. It's probably because you need secretory antibodies in your gut to protect you, and those go away very quickly after an infection. You have memory, but not secretory antibodies. It's spread by contaminated hands, but foods also can be contaminated. Food handlers who are infected and shedding, but don't have symptoms, so they go to work, they prepare food, they contaminate it, someone eats it, boom, outbreak of uh, rotavirus, and the viruses are very stable. They will last long periods of time. Heck, they have to pass through the GI tract. Of course, they're going to be stable, right? So on, on uh, food preparation areas, they can last for long periods of time. The incubation period is short, and as I said, asymptomatic infections are important in spread. As you get older, you get infected without symptoms, and you're likely to do whatever it is that you do normally and spread infection. So the virus uh, in younger kids causes vomiting and four to eight days of diarrhea and fever, and you have to usually have good fluid replacement. So you'll be fine, you will recover, the virus will be cleared eventually, uh, as long as you can uh, replace your fluids. So we call this a two-bucket disease, okay? <laughs> you, got, you get that? Two buckets, because you have vomiting and diarrhea. I learned that from a microbiologist, yes. yes. Um, how effective is um, hand washing with soap and water at removing, like, the, you know, less okay. than, or more than... Okay, right, so how, how effective is hand washing? So studies have been done which show that, you know, you can't get rid of all virus, but you can certainly reduce uh, the amount of virus load on your hand by giving it a good hand wash. You know, you're supposed to say the alphabet while you're using soap and water. It's better than nothing. And it does cut down transmission. It doesn't make it zero, but it will help, yeah. You don't wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> you should, it really helps. It's two bucket disease. All right, what happens? <laughs>
you ingest the virus, it passes through your stomach, and it infects the mucosal cells in your uh, gastrointestinal tract. It replicates in them, of course, is shed in the feces or diarrhea. And this is, uh, these are some pictures of villi uh, that illustrate what's happening. This is another virus that you can give to volunteers because it's not lethal, it just causes a nasty diarrhea. Uh, the virus infects the villi. Um, diarrhea starts within uh, 12 hours of infection and then eventually the villi get blunted. They get shortened by virus infection. And that probably contributes to the diarrhea. And you can see high virus titers at this point being shed. And then by seven days, uh, the virus is gone. The villi have recovered. You know, villi are always shedding cells and regenerating. So this is not surprising and there's just no more diarrhea. This section of intestine is stained for viral antigen. So you can see the virus replicating in distinct cells uh, of, the, of the villi. We have two vaccines that are used uh, in the U.S. They're made by two different companies. Merck makes one and GlaxoSmithKline makes the others. Uh, the other Rotorix is this one here. It's an infectious attenuated human isolate. So it's a human rotavirus that's been passaged to make it lose its virulence. And you take this by mouth. It replicates in your intestine, doesn't cause any disease, and it uh, induces protective immunity. And Rotatech is the other one, which is a mixture of different serotypes. And each of these are human bovine reassortants. So rotaviruses infect many different animals, but the ones that infect animals do not cause disease in humans. So you can, re you can introduce the genes from the human viruses into, sorry, in from the animal viruses into the human strains. As long as you keep the surface proteins from the human strains, uh, these won't cause disease, but they'll immunize you against the human proteins. So that's uh, the, the uh, Glaxo, I think, virus vaccine. And they're both orally taken. Um, a couple of years ago, someone decided to sequence all the vaccines that are produced. And they found that these were both contaminated by a virus called porcine circovirus. This is a small, single-stranded DNA-containing virus that infects pigs. So the, the vaccines were taken off the market for a while. Um, but then they were put back on because, you know, these vaccines had been extensively clinically trialed and there were no side effects of having uh, porcine circle virus in them. As far as we know, this virus doesn't replicate in people. Do you want to know where it came from? So when you grow viruses, you grow them in cells, at least this kind of virus. And cell culture, I don't know if any of you have ever done cell culture, but to grow cells, you have to split them with trypsin. Trypsin comes from pig pancreas. That's where it's purified from. So the pig pancreas has the virus in it. It gets into the cells. And we didn't know this because we never looked for it. And when someone sequenced it, they found it. So presumably, at some point, we'll modify the procedure to make circovirus-free rotavirus vaccines. But this is something that will take years because you have to grow them without using this trypsin. You have to make batches. You have to do a brand new clinical trial to test it to make sure it's safe. And then you can use that in, in humans. If you want to read more about that, I wrote about it a couple of years ago. The other virus that causes uh, gastroenterovirus is norovirus. This is a different virus, a plus-stranded RNA virus in the Caliciviridae family. And this typically infects older people. So rotavirus tends to infect very young kids, because as you get older, you get immunity to it and less disease. Noro can infect a wide range of people, typically older, uh, people, and it causes half of all the food-borne outbreaks of gastroenteritis. That's 23 million cases a year of gastroenteritis in the U.S. And we still haven't figured out how to grow this virus. We cannot propagate this virus in culture, so hard to make a vaccine. So these are the known causes of food-borne illness in the U.S. This is tracked very carefully because people are always getting sick from stuff that is in their food. Here's norovirus, 49%. Bacteria are a big cause, of course, and then other things here as well. Now, when you finish this course, you're not going to go in a bathroom. You're not going to eat anymore. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> norovirus, gastro. <laughs> yeah, it's also. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Another two it's another two-bucket disease. <laughs> right. I, this one I got from a neurovirologist. I think this is really good. Uh, it's also fecally orally spread, just like Rhoda, with poor hand hygiene, but also from food handlers, as you'll see. 
passes through the stomach. It also causes blunting of villi, just like rotavirus does, I showed you before. We don't really know why it causes vomiting or diarrhea. We have some clues for rotavirus. Rotavirus makes an enterotoxin, the NSP4 protein that I talked about last time. We think that helps cause diarrhea, but since we can't grow these neuroviruses in culture, it's really hard to study them and figure out what's causing uh, the diarrhea. Uh, affects all ages of people, so as you get older, you get reinfected and you get gastroenteritis. You don't get a lot of protection at all from multiple infections, very different from rotavirus. Uh, these occur year-round but tend to peak in cold weather, and the outbreaks often occur in closed environments like nursing homes, hospitals, cruise ships. This is a big one on cruise ships. And all these other uh, places where lots of people are together and it favors person-to-person -person spread. Um, the incubation period is short and you get a very quick onset of vomiting and diarrhea. Very short illness, unless you have a poor immune system. But here there are asymptomatic infections, just like rotas, that uh, can spread the virus. So you can have food handlers who are shedding norovirus at high quantities, high levels of virus, and they can contaminate food. And that's, that's often what happens on a cruise ship, uh, the, that one of the food handlers will have an asymptomatic infection, they'll contaminate the food, and then the whole ship gets infected. Uh, viral shedding eventually ends, so this is an acute infection, but look, it can go on for 56 days after you recover. It can keep shedding virus, so you're feeling better, you go about your normal life, and you infect other people. You can not only transmit by fecal-oral, but also when you vomit, you make an aerosol, and on airplanes, this has been shown to spread neurovirus infection. So you're not only gonna not eat or not go to the bathroom, you're not gonna get on a plane, and I'm gonna make sure you don't take a cruise ever, also, in a moment. <laughs> contamination of uh, envir environmental contamination also. So shellfish beds that are contaminated by sewage. Human sewage running off into the ocean, and the shellfish take it up, they concentrate the virus. You eat a raw clam or oyster, you get norovirus infection. So I'm, I'm eliminating oysters, but you're not eating anyway, so it doesn't matter. Right? Uh, even even uh, f fruits and vegetables have been implicated, they're washed with contaminated uh, water. And as I said, you don't have very good immunity. You keep getting reinfected, and we really don't understand if that's because there are a lot of strains or the immunity wanes, needs to be sorted out. So here are some uh, analyses of what kinds of infection, the modes of transmission, 88% person to person, so bad hand <coughs> hygiene, foodborne 10%, so it's not a lot of foodborne. Most of the bit is contamination from person to person, a little bit of waterborne. And here are the settings. Um, restaurants, catered meals, 40%. Retirement centers, nursing homes, hospitals, 25% of the outbreaks. Schools and daycares, a lot of outbreaks in uh, schools throughout the US. Cruise ships, okay. These cruise ships are only 10%, but every time one is called back to port, to make a big deal about this. I guess it's a big deal to have your vacation cut short, but you can see most of the uh, settings are not cruise ships, in fact. Here's a nice article from 2011 where um, on an airplane someone vomited and they had norovirus uh, in, in their vomitus. They passed it to the crew. The crew was cleaning up, right? And then the crew went on another flight and they were infected and they infected people on the other flight as well. So and all this is because the crew didn't know they were infected. It was in them and incubating and they were shedding it. So uh, this can be a problem in these closed types of, set of settings. Cruise ships are not the happiest places on Earth. We do keep a very careful record of cruise ship outbreaks because we can. We can monitor what's going on. It's a closed situation. We can get samples from anyone. So the CDC keeps a very careful record of what cruises were uh, affected and when. And sometimes we can isolate norovirus, but sometimes we cannot. So there may be other agents that are causing uh, outbreaks as well. Again, these are not the majority of settings, but they're a good place for outbreaks. You have everyone eating a common source of food. If there is a food handler that contaminates the food, it will spread to everyone. Uh, if one person is, is infected who's not a, a food handler but a passenger, they can easily spread it to others as well. You know, they can put their hands in the, in the buffet and boom, you're done. 
So we track illnesses on cruise ships, close living quarters, new passenger arrivals may bring the virus. You know, they bring these ships into port, they clean them, but you can never get rid of everything. And uh, then they send them back out again with a brand new set of people. So it's gonna happen over and over again. So how do you prevent neurovirus infection? Wash your hands often. Right, this is a CDC recommendation. Rinse your fruit and vegetables well, cook your shellfish, clean your surfaces. And if you are sick, don't prepare food for others and stay away from the mint in the restaurant. Even if they're wrapped, okay, as you go out the door, don't pick up a mint. People have done studies on these things and they're totally contaminated, right? Do not pick up, but you're not gonna eat anyway, so it's not a problem. All right, so you can help yourself if you do the right things. All right, next question is, rotavirus transmission could be curbed by You have to get this one right, every one of you, except someone who doesn't wash their hands. Is someone like joking? <laughs> it has to be. I know, I think you do this to bug me sometimes. <laughs> uh, I forgot to tell you, so norovirus is one of those viruses that you can give to people, and classic studies are done with medical students. So, so the, we can't grow this virus in the laboratory. So how do you think we give these medical students norovirus? What do we feed them? Oral yeah. We give them filtered diarrhea. Okay, so the medical students sign up for this. You get paid 300 bucks. You go in on Friday, you drink this, you get sick over the weekend, and by Monday you're well and you can go back to classes. $300. Not worth it, no? But I think, I think they flavor the, the <laughs> diarrhea. All right, last virus is West Nile. I, I, I like this cartoon. So West Nile actually was not isolated in uh, Egypt. It was isolated in Uganda, the West Nile district of Uganda in 1937 was not present in the Western Hemisphere until 1999. It arrived here in New York City. And uh, its sequence is identical. The New York isolate is just the same as a virus isolated from a goose in Israel. So somehow the virus came from Israel. So it's, it's present in birds in various parts of Africa and in the Middle East. And somehow it came to the US, maybe in an infected passenger, and has since spread throughout uh, the entire uh, US. Uh, so here's the spread of West Nile in green. Uh, it's overlapping another virus. So the whole US, much of Canada, uh, extending down into South America, and also great parts of Europe, uh, Africa, Asia, and Australia as well have this virus. So originally it was just present uh, here. Uh, and it infects many birds and ca is carried by mosquitoes as well as other kinds of vertebrates. It's a flavivirus. It is an enveloped virus with glycoproteins lying parallel on the surface with an icosahedral capsid inside. It's a plus-stranded uh, RNA virus. In nature, it exists in a cycle of transmission between mosquitoes and birds. So this is how it's maintained. And the, the geese in Israel are part of that cycle. Occasionally, when the mosquitoes bite people or horses, for example, these are dead-end hosts. They get disease, but the virus isn't transmitted uh, to anyone else. So in the US, when it arrived, it must have established a reservoir in birds in the US, and that's why it is still here. Uh, so the, the mosquitoes that best transmit it are Culex-type mosquitoes. The incubation period is three to 14 days. And 20 to 30% of people who get the virus develop a flu-like illness called West Nile fever. But there are a lot of infections that are asymptomatic. So this virus has spread rapidly through the US without causing a lot of disease, and we can tell this by serological surveys. Lots of people get infected uh, because in particularly in, in uh, warm months, we have lots of mosquito activity and they carry this virus. One in 150 individuals develop a neuroinvasive disease. The virus goes into the brain and you get all these symptoms associated with it. You can have long lasting neurological sequelae from these infections. So you do not want to be to have this virus get into your brain. 10% mortality when it's neuroinvasive and you can get a polio-like uh, flaccid paralysis. And we talked a couple of lectures ago about how 
TLR3 sensing uh, this virus, at least in mice, gives rise to the production of tumor necrosis factor, which perme permeabilizes the blood-brain barrier and allows the virus uh, to get in there. So here's how the pathogenesis works. We have the natural cycle of the virus between birds and mosquitoes. So wild birds are okay with this virus. They typically don't die, but when it's introduced into an exotic bird that hasn't seen it before, they die. So we first picked it up in New York because exotic birds in the Bronx Zoo were dying. And a very astute pathologist, she said, this isn't right, and they ended up finding viruses in these, in these exotic birds. But uh, other birds, wild birds, uh, don't get sick from it. Uh, the virus is delivered to humans. It's picked up by dendritic cells. The virus can actually replicate in dendritic cells. And they bring the virus, of course, to the lymph node, where it can replicate in more uh, lymph cells. You establish a viremia. And the viremia can bring it to the spleen, where there are even more uh, lymphoid cells, of course. Uh, and that gives you a secondary viremia. Uh, the, the host, of course, responds by sensing it with TLR3. You make tumor necrosis factor. And that permeabilizes the blood-brain barrier, so the virus can get in there. We think it may replicate in and kill neurons, but this hasn't been well studied, and there isn't a good animal model for doing that. And in the brain, you also have an immune response. Cells and cytokines come in to try and clear the infection. These undoubtedly contribute uh, to the symptoms. So if the virus doesn't get into the brain, it's a mild infection. But when, it's, when it does, it's a problem. And here are some numbers for West Nile in the US uh, from 1999 when it was first introduced. You can see uh, some years, a lot of cases. This is the total number of cases that have been diagnosed. There may be many, many more infections, remember, because a lot of asymptomatic infections. Total cases versus uh, those where the virus gets in the brain, meningitis, encephalitis in the white bars. Uh, and the last one I could, there, there is data for more recent years, but not all nicely accumulated uh, such as it is here. Um, the case fatality ratio rises as you get older. So this is a very nice example of how very old individuals are susceptible to fatal disease. So this is death induced by West Nile virus. You see young individuals have no problem uh, with the infection, but in older individuals starting at 40 and above, the case fatality ratio goes up. Uh, in 2012, this was the West Nile activity uh, in the US. Uh, these, these circles are uh, West Nile confirmed human cases. You can see they're spread pretty much throughout the US. Their concentrations in the, in the middle of the country uh, where uh, mosquitoes breed well and in California as well, but every state have it. We have it here in, in New York as well. And that year there were 5,300 cases, 2,700 neuroinvasive cases, quite a good fraction, 243 deaths. So you know this is not a large number in the scheme of things, but again, you, you really don't want any deaths from these diseases if they can be prevented. Sometimes um, blood donors transmit the infection. It, the blood is screened for West Nile virus, but in some cases, um, it isn't picked up, and uh, transmission occurs that way, in addition to mosquito bites. So at the moment, the only thing we can do to prevent West Nile is to do mosquito control. Uh, and so we try and eliminate standing water where mosquitoes breed and so forth, use screens on windows, very low-tech solutions, but it does work to keep the mosquito population down. And people are working on a vaccine, which I think eventually would be available to uh, anyone who wants it.